Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we discuss cases that involve corruption and negligence from the people that we are expected to trust. These cases range from the police ignoring protocol to corporations placing people's lives in jeopardy in order to maximize profit. Today, I'm drinking a froze. How about you, Jenny? I have a hard cider, one of my favorites. Del, we are in for a wild ride with this case today. This case has everything we don't like. Police incompetency, child abuse, human trafficking, and cover-ups. And just as a warning, we will be discussing disturbing content, including child sex abuse and sex trafficking. In the early morning hours of Sunday, September 5th, 1982, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh was preparing for his paper route in West Des Moines, Iowa. He took his red wagon and his dog Gretchen out with him and started his day. Johnny had become a paper boy to save up for a dirt bike, which he was able to buy. Normally, Johnny's dad, John, accompanied him on his paper route, but didn't this morning. According to Noreen, his mother, Johnny asked his parents to do his route alone the night before, but they refused. It seems that Johnny actually didn't wake up his dad that morning, which was their usual practice. Around 7 a.m., the Goshes received phone calls from neighbors asking where their papers were. At first, the family thought Johnny may have overslept, but he wasn't in his bedroom. Soon, Gretchen the dog returned to their home alone. Johnny's dad went out to look for him and found the red wagon just two blocks from the family home, but no Johnny. Noreen quickly called the police. While waiting for the police, the Goshes contacted other local paper boys who painted a picture of the morning's event. Five eyewitnesses, one adult and four children, came forward saying they saw Johnny and some mysterious men in the neighborhood. John Rossi, an adult, saw Johnny talking to a man in a two-toned, two-door Ford Fairmont. Rossi said the man looked wired from caffeine and that it appeared he had asked Johnny for directions. Johnny asked Rossi if he could help the man, and as Rossi approached, the man sped away. A fellow paperboy named Mike saw this or something similar happen and said Johnny told him he was scared and that something was wrong with that man. Mike also saw a tall man come out from between two houses on a nearby street and head in Johnny's direction. Two other paper boys later saw Johnny on the street and said hi to him, but when the boys walked back, they only saw the abandoned wagon with papers. Around the same time, a neighbor heard a car door close and looked out the window and saw a car roll through a stop sign, make a left, and speed away. This car was also described as a two-toned, two-door Ford Fairmont. The police arrived 45 minutes after Noreen's 911 call, despite the fact that the police station was only 10 blocks away from the Gosh's home. They asked if Johnny was a runaway. They asked Noreen and John if he had run away before and if he was unhappy at home, which, similar to the Misty Copsy case we covered, Johnny had never run away and his parents were offended that the police even asked that. Of course they have to ask, but this runaway idea led the police to some inaction, some would say. And it's important to note, Johnny was only 12. I don't really know where he could run away to and how he could really get away. The eyewitnesses were all ignored by police, and police said no witnesses saw anything that would explain Johnny's disappearance. They also claimed to have no crime scene. To law enforcement, Johnny just vanished. We have to note that in 1982, it was standards for families and police to wait longer than 24 hours before a child could officially be reported missing. It seems like 72 hours was the waiting period for the West Des Moines police. I'm not sure how true this is, but in the documentary Who Took Johnny, a reporter from the Des Moines Register, the newspaper Johnny delivered for, said, quote, kids who disappeared generally ran away at this time, end quote. The opinion of the public was that no one would kidnap or hurt a 12-year-old paper boy. People didn't believe this could or would happen in their neighborhood. Four days after Johnny's disappearance, thousands of people searched for him. This was something either Johnny's parents or the community and friends and family set up. But Noreen says that the police never organized any type of search. 
I believe the search started based off a tip that Johnny's parents had gotten from a psychic. The psychic said that Johnny was dead and would be found within two miles of his home. And of course, a psychic isn't the most credible source, but when the police aren't doing anything for you, I'm sure, you know, you'll take whatever lead or tip you can get. Johnny's dad actually said while everyone was out searching, he found a police officer with a radar gun trying to catch speeders, which John was not happy about. Again, John and Noreen felt the police didn't take the case seriously and even the community at large didn't think the police were handling the case properly. A father of one of the eyewitnesses even said, quote, police just said he was a runaway. We know him and he didn't run away, end quote. The family really pushed the police to find their missing son and Irene's don't take no for an answer attitude rubbed police and the local news the wrong way. Headlines went from Johnny being missing to the conflict between police and his family and this affected public opinion of the Goshes. Allegedly, officers asked to be removed from the case because they didn't want to deal with Noreen. The West Des Moines chief of police at the time was Oral Cooney, who was open about his feelings towards Noreen. He even said in an interview, quote, I don't give a damn about what she has to say, end quote. Noreen claimed he yelled at her on at least one occasion and was told she had to prove her son was in danger. The Goshers did get some vindication because it was proven that the police weren't in fact handling Johnny's case correctly. In 1983, 18 of the 37 officers of the West Des Moines Police filed complaints against Chief Cooney. Complaints include Cooney fixing tickets for friends and family, working while drunk, showing racial discrimination, and interfering with an investigation against his son. Six months later, Cooney resigned and investigation showed, quote, administrative deficiencies in his work. At some point, Ken Wooden, a reporter who had investigated pedophilia, took a look at the case and came to the conclusion that Johnny was most likely abducted by a pedophile or a pedophile ring. He recommended the family keep Johnny's name in the media and viewed it as one of the only ways to solve his case. It seems that in West Des Moines in the early 80s, pedophilia was not a widely known thing. Noreen and Wooden attempted to educate the community on the issue, but no one wanted to hear about organized pedophile rings. They facilitated workshops for the community, which had low attendance and received little media coverage. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months without any sign of Johnny. Noreen was working just as hard in her search for her son. In 1983, there was a sighting of Johnny in Oklahoma when a woman claimed a young boy being chased by two men ran up to her and said, please help me, I'm John David Gosh. The men grabbed the young boy before she could react. Police at first told her that this was a quote, family situation, but the woman later saw Johnny's picture on TV and called the police. The Gosh's private detective and FBI analyzed the situation and both agreed it was Johnny. In 1984, just before the two-year anniversary, Eugene Martin, a 13-year-old paper boy, went missing while on his paper route in Des Moines, Iowa. He was also seen talking to a man in a car. Eugene usually delivered papers with his older brother, but they weren't together that morning. Police didn't feel his disappearance was related to Johnny's and said there was no similarities other than the boy's gender. However, there were several similar conditions, including the day of the week, time, their ages, and both being paper boys. Shortly after Eugene's disappearance, a relative of Eugene's working at a local dairy company reached out to see if they could help. The company decided to put photos of Johnny and Eugene on milk cartons to help publicize their cases. The boys were among some of the first missing children to be on a milk carton. In 1985, another sign of Johnny was found. A woman shopping at a supermarket in Sioux City, Iowa, received a dollar bill that said, I am alive, Johnny Gosh, signed in cursive. Handwriting experts analyzed the letter and said it matched Johnny's handwriting. However, police have allegedly not been able to confirm this. In March 1986, a 14-year-old boy named Mark Allen went missing from Des Moines, Iowa after walking to a friend's house one evening. He never made it to his friend's home and was never seen again. Police again saw no similarities between Mark, Eugene, and Johnny's disappearances, but Noreen thinks all three boys were abducted into a human sex trafficking network. Mark Allen's mother, Nancy, isn't sure if her son's disappearance is related, but feels the police were hesitant to investigate because of Johnny and Eugene's cases. Then, almost 10 years later, the case took an unexpected turn. 
A 24-year-old convicted child molester named Paul Bonassi claimed to have participated in Johnny's abduction. He had previously told a psychiatrist this information, and his lawyer, John DeCamp, came across it while reading an interview transcript in 1989. DeCamp first notified John Gosh of Bonassi's statement, and John actually had a private investigator look into Bonassi. After talking to him for hours, the investigator felt Bonassi was telling the truth. Noreen was finally notified about Bonassi in 1991. Banasi claimed he was part of the same child sex ring that abducted Johnny and that he was forced to help in his abduction. According to Banasi, someone from the pedophile ring snuck up on Johnny and Banasi helped hold Johnny down and chloroform him. He alleged Johnny was abducted for child porn, sex magazines, and you can assume the rest. And that the ring wanted kids who weren't used because they were worth more. Once abducted, Bonassi says he tried to calm Johnny and told him to do what he was told and that everything would be all right. Noreen and John both visited Bonassi behind bars. Bonassi broke down when he met Noreen and quickly opened up to her. It's important to note that Bonassi didn't get any type of deal for a lesser sentence when he admitted to his involvement in the disappearance, and he said that he just wanted to help people. During his meeting with Noreen, Bonassi drew a map of the plan to kidnap Johnny and locations of where people were stationed. He claimed a man named Emilio, who he had known since he was a child, was behind the scheme. According to him, Emilio picked him up the night before the kidnapping from Nebraska and took him to a Des Moines, Iowa hotel where they met two other men. One of the men had photos of paper boys and Benassi noticed Johnny's photo was set aside from the bunch. The next morning, Emilio, or a man named Tony, we've seen different takes, drove the car that Johnny was abducted in and a Des Moines contact for the pedophile ring was also involved. Benassi alleged that he kept Johnny tied and gagged after someone pushed Johnny into the car. He said Johnny was taken to a farmhouse in Sioux City, Iowa, where he was kept until someone bought him and took him to Colorado. Benassi admitted to molesting Johnny on film and said pictures of the abuse were taken as a way to entice buyers. He told Noreen that Johnny talked about yoga and meditation, which impressed her because this was something she claimed to never have divulged with police or the press. Benassi could describe several of Johnny's scars and birthmarks, some known to the public and some not. And he was also able to describe Johnny's stammer, too. He was able to identify a man from a photo lineup that the Goshes believed was involved in Johnny's abduction as well. Noreen left her meeting with Benassi feeling that he was telling the truth because he knew impossible things. During his incarceration, he even received letters from other victims that made reference to Johnny Gosh, Emilio, and other missing Des Moines boys. Some were suspicious of Benassi and felt he could have been a con man taking advantage of the situation, however. However, for some background on Banasi, he had been sexually abused since the age of six and was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder, which is now known as disassociative identity disorder, which he wasn't diagnosed with until later in his life. And this likely stemmed from his years of sexual abuse. Most importantly, he claimed to be a victim of a child sex ring in nearby Omaha, Nebraska that was linked to a scandal involving the Franklin Federal Credit Union in Omaha. In short, the scandal arose in 1988 when it was found that credit union manager Lawrence E. King was embezzling millions of dollars from the company. King was also a prominent donor for the Republican Party and sang the national anthem at the 1984 and 1988 Republican National Conventions. Allegations of sexual misconduct with teenage boys and girls were made against credit union members, including King. FBI agents investigated the use of credit union funds to transport minors across state lines. These accusations went even deeper and included a child sex and exploitation ring that reportedly catered to some of Omaha's most respected, wealthy, and powerful citizens. Victims of the ring would often be taken to depraved parties, sometimes attended by politicians, where they'd be sexually abused or offered money in return for sex. One of King's accusers was Paul Bonassi. A grand jury found the accusations to all be unfounded, and two of the accusers, including Bonassi, were indicted and charged with perjury. Bonassi's charges were dropped since he was already serving time for a child sex abuse charge, and Lawrence E. King was only charged with impact. In 1992 and 93, America's Most Wanted got involved and aired two episodes highlighting Johnny's case. The second episode focused heavily on Benassi. In it, he shared details.
details on how the child trafficking ring ran and said that the ring blackmailed people with photos and destroyed their identities. He also told them that he had seen Johnny again in Colorado in 1986 and that Johnny had been brought by a man named the Colonel and that he had been branded. Benassi took the show's crew to a house in Colorado where he claimed children had been kept. Beforehand, he described a gate in front of the house which led to a chamber beneath the home and sure enough, the gate was as he described. In the chamber, there were wooden beams carved with countless initials alleged to be the children who were kept at the house. This chamber was in an unfinished empty basement. It had dirt floors and lights that hung from wooden beams, but no real walls or insulation. After the segments aired, other victims contacted America's Most Wanted to show their branding and to share their stories. America's Most Wanted did another segment with a man named Jimmy, who also claimed to have been on the same ranch in Colorado as Johnny and was branded in the same way as Benassi described. He later met with Gosh's parents and gave them personal diaries that included more details about Johnny. However, this promise and revelation didn't lead anywhere. The former owner of the house was a prison guard who had actually disappeared. The composite sketch America's Most Wanted showed led to no leads. West Des Moines police never talked to Benassi. They claimed he said little to nothing to convince them that he was involved. Johnny's parents felt that the police's little interest was a clue to a massive cover-up happening and even said so in a television interview. Investigators did talk to Benassi's siblings 10 years after Johnny's disappearance and they claimed Benassi was in Omaha at the time of his disappearance. It's important to note that Omaha is only two hours from West Des Moines. Again, the case went cold. But Noreen would soon admit to something shocking. While testifying during Benassi's 1999 civil trial against King, she claimed to have seen Johnny in March of 1997. She said in the middle of the night, there was a knock on her apartment door. It was two young men and she recognized the eyes of one of the men as Johnny's. He said, it's me, mom. And they spoke for about an hour. During their conversation, he explained some of the logistics behind the child trafficking ring, including that the kids kids were forced to do illegal things so that they were less likely to try and seek help. He didn't go into detail on his abuse. The other man with Johnny didn't speak and he wasn't introduced. Noreen said she wanted to call the police, but Johnny got upset and said, quote, they'll kill me. This caused a media frenzy and Noreen later said she wished she hadn't brought it up in court. She claimed she never mentioned anything because Johnny told her not to and she felt like she'd endangered her son. Benassi feels as though Johnny knows too much and will be killed if he comes forward. There weren't any case updates until August 2006. Noreen and several others involved in the case received photos in the mail of boys who were bound and gagged. These photos are easy to find but I want to warn everyone that they're really hard to look at. Noreen believed Johnny was in some of these photos and she sent them to the West Des Moines Law Enforcement and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The photos were tracked to a child porn site and it was quickly shut down. Some of the photos were also linked to a case in Florida, but one boy in several photos could not be identified. This is the boy Noreen believes is Johnny, but his dad disagrees because he doesn't see Johnny's chest birthmark. John Johnny Gosh is still listed as a missing person. To this day, the police say they don't know what happened to him, but consider his case active. Although at least one lieutenant says he believes Johnny is dead. Eugene Martin and Mark Allen, the other boys abducted, have never been found. Eugene's parents are unfortunately both deceased and there have been no case updates for either Eugene or Mark's cases. If Johnny is alive today, he would be 50 years old. There are several theories associated with this case. These theories are purely speculative and we may never know what really happened to Johnny. We are not here to convince you of someone's guilt or innocence and all persons are presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. First is that Johnny was abducted and taken into a pedophile ring and is either alive today or was killed by the ring. Noreen believes this is what happened to Johnny and she believes that he is still alive today. Paul Benassi also seems to feel this way. Ken Wooden, a reporter that helped on the case, also said he felt Johnny was abducted. Several private investigators hired by the Goshes seem to believe this as well. Another widely accepted theory is that Johnny was abducted by a lone predator and killed. This is what a psychic told the Goshes, and it's definitely a plausible theory. Noreen feels there is no evidence that points to Johnny being dead, however. 
And there kind of isn't. If we haven't found a body, it, we can infer that someone might not be dead. Some people believe that Johnny's father was involved in his disappearance because he didn't accompany Johnny on his route like usual. It's been questioned whether or not John went straight home after discovering Johnny was missing or if he delivered the rest of the papers before heading home. Noreen makes some allegations against John in her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home. She claims in the months leading up to Johnny's disappearance, Johnny was behaving strangely. She said he was depressed. She actually needed to have police do a welfare check on him while he was on a business trip. And he was also acting very hateful toward her older children. We mentioned how the night before Johnny's disappearance, he asked to deliver papers alone. And in the book, Noreen claims John initially told him yes and alludes to the fact that John may have gone behind her back. She also felt John was hiding Benassi's claims from her and found it strange that he had someone investigate Benassi for so long. She even said the investigator was the first to tell her about Benassi, not John, who was her husband. John has also changed his tune about Benassi and no longer believes him. Also in Noreen's book, she says the family was receiving phone calls on Sundays at 1 a.m. with no one on the other line, and that the morning of Johnny's disappearance, family got a phone call and John spoke to the person on the other line instead of just answering and saying wrong number, which he had done many times before. John has been generally quiet about his son's disappearance until recent years where he spoke in documentaries, TV specials, and podcasts. There are many other allegations against John, but they borderline on strange conspiracies and we won't get into them, but we do encourage everyone to look into this case. This is really a rabbit hole. There's so much information, so many newspaper clippings, so many old articles, so much you can find and it is very interesting. Now, the craziest theory that we have and this is a conspiracy really, is that Johnny is alive and is living as Jeff Gannon. Jeff Gannon was a journalist and White House correspondent for a right-wing website named Talon News, and he had his own radio program in the early 2000s. He attended several presidential briefings and even asked President Bush questions on several occasions. And he was even, I think, mocked by Jon Stewart on The Daily Show before information came out about him. So it was somehow discovered that Gannon was not who he said he was. Not only was James Guckert his real name, but he had gotten into the White House under false pretenses and was a former sex worker with a website to prove it. Because of his connection to sex work and his initials JG, people began to wonder if he was Johnny Gosh's new identity. Many think Gannon and Johnny look similar and have similar body markings, but I personally don't see a resemblance. If Gannon is to be believed, he would be over 10 years older than Johnny. And another reason people wonder if Johnny is Jeff or James, I don't even know how to address him actually. Um, another reason they think this is because Gannon has been quiet on his childhood and there's little to no information available about it. He claims to have gone to high school in Pennsylvania and he did graduate from a Pennsylvania college as well. Gannon has denied all claims of this and Noreen does not believe this theory either. Uh, so, Del, what do you think could have possibly happened to Johnny? Listen, Jenny, I really want to believe that he's actually Jeff Gannon. Gannon has such a crazy public life, and a part of being so intrigued by it, I was a regular watcher of The Daily Show when Jon Stewart was the host, and I remember him making fun of Gannon because he asked Bush an obscenely easy, you know, pass the duck type question. So, I remember him, and so... When reading about this case and seeing their connection, I was like, this has to be the theory, but there's actually no truth, <laughs> you know, behind this. I believe that Johnny was abducted and sold into human trafficking, specifically um, child sex trafficking. There is no reason not to believe Benassi. His story is so wild. I really don't think that he could make it up. He had so many specific details. And like Noreen was saying, he knew things that no one else would know, like his favorite things and the different marks that he had on his body. I just don't think that he would have had the 
ability to make that up and be so convincing that Johnny's mom would believe him. And the fact that Johnny's dad doesn't believe him, honestly, he's a whole messed up person. And the fact that even Arena saying that he's full of shit makes you think that he's full of shit. There's a lot to consider with his dad. I think I really only scratched the surface when I was doing my research. It's interesting to consider and it is very sad if he was involved somehow. Uh, But I agree. I believe Johnny was abducted and most likely sold into a child sex trafficking ring. If not, I do think he was abducted by a lone predator and killed. But so much evidence to me points to human trafficking. An expert on pedophilia who examined the case and worked with the Goshes thought this was the unfortunate reality of the situation. And I do think Benassi is trustworthy. We know that, you know, hurt people hurt people. He was a criminal he was a child molester, but he had been molested himself and he never changed his story and he provided so many details that no one would know unless they interacted with Johnny themselves or if they knew people that interacted with Johnny. And it's not just him. There's those letters that people were sending him, other victims were sending him in prison. And this was before there was like a media storm around his confessions. And that's really telling to me. And whoever the boy Jimmy was that they America's most wanted interviewed he had the same branding like this all can't be a coincidence in my opinion and that house that he took america's most wanted to was real and i really do encourage everyone to find that clip if they can because the room that chamber is so scary to see and to think about what happened in there and another reason i think banasi is telling the truth was because he admitted to noreen's face that he molested johnny and I don't really see why he would lie to her face about that, doing something so horrible to her son. And I know we've talked before about people lying to get attention and to feel like they're involved in cases somehow, but Benassi just seems different to me. When he came forward, like we said, he never got a deal. There wasn't anything for him to gain. He really did want to clear his conscience and help. To me, Eugene Martin's disappearance definitely looks like it's related to Johnny's, but I'm not as certain about Mark Allen's just because it was a different time of day and it seems maybe a little more opportunistic. I don't know if Johnny is alive or if he really visited Noreen. I don't know why she would lie about that if it didn't happen. She herself knows that there would be no benefit of putting this information out in the public sphere since she already faced so much scrutiny and hatred even. In all honesty, I can see this being a cruel prank that someone played on her, but I do hope it's true and that he actually visited her. Um, There was a letter that Johnny had like allegedly written to his parents and it had mentioned how the ring had died his hair and she said that the man that came to her door had dyed black hair so you can connect the dots with that. I would really like to think that Johnny is alive and well and that he's secretly communicating with Noreen somehow. This case has so many details and moving parts. It's so much to take in. And Del, you weren't really familiar with this case until I suggested it, right? Right. It's it's wild. <laughs> I hate to just constantly say that, but it's a case that really shook the country. And as we'll talk about, it led to a lot of really amazing things um, taking place. But to start, we want to look at the culture and the climate of the period that Johnny disappeared in. We recommend watching the documentary Who Took Johnny. Um, you can find it on Amazon. I got it from my library, actually, from a streaming service they have. But in the documentary, what surprised me most was how often people were saying it was shocking that this could happen to a child, that some, a child could be abducted and sold into sex slavery and that there's bad people hurting children. Noreen mentions people didn't really know what the term human trafficking was in the 80s and no one was really aware of how sick and horrible the world could be to children despite bad things happening to children all the time. They've happened since the beginning of history, unfortunately. People back then let their children out at night. They didn't lock their doors or windows. There was an overall feeling of safety and I'm sure that was definitely the case for a wealthy Midwestern suburb like West Des Moines. Even when presented with these facts about child sex abuse and pedophiles, the community seemed to turn a blind eye, which I do understand because it is such a disturbing topic and it really sticks with you when you hear details. It's gross, to say the least. But learning these things is a way to protect your family and We see this a lot in life. The public wants to ignore horrific things that are happening because they're uncomfortable and it's a hard to swallow pill. But this discomfort 
can lead to action. And while this was going on, this kind of obliviousness or willful ignorance, some areas of the country during the 70s and 80s, they were worried about children being abducted, sexually abused, and murdered by satanic cults. And this gave way to the satanic panic of the late 80s and 90s, where rumors and accusations of satanic cults performing ritual abuse ran rampant across the country. This satanic panic is definitely something I would like to cover later on the podcast. I think it's so fascinating. Um, I know we're going to talk about the West Memphis Three at a later point, and I know that's tied in with the satanic panic, but it's, it's a very uniquely American thing, I would say. Yeah, and I definitely agree. It's one of those things where, unfortunately, in the history of America, we do have a tendency to look at things that are not as much of a problem And then say, well, we can't solve the real problem that's happening because we're trying to tackle this fake problem that we've created in our heads. And unfortunately, it seems like the culture of West Des Moines was that we're really going to focus on a non-existent issue and we're going to forget that children can be victimized. It's also really weird to see this because stranger danger and protecting yourself is so ingrained in children now. I know it was ingrained in me. I know I'm sure Del, you learned about this in school and had classes on what to do if someone was, you know, going to try to hurt you or touch you in some way. Right. And it's one of the things that we use as a staple of, okay, self-preservation. And the fact that people were thinking, okay, yeah, I need to protect myself, but I don't need to protect my kid or that a 12 year old at any point could be possibly classified as a runaway tells you exactly what was going on in the minds of the police officers that were assigned to this case. And we'll get to all of that later. But we did mention that Johnny's case left a lasting legacy that helped countless children and families and ended this era of innocence. It was one of the several cases in the 70s and 80s that transformed behavior, raised awareness, and improved the likelihood of children being returned home. In 1984, Aton Patz, who was abducted in 1979 in New York City, was the first missing child put on a milk carton, and the practice grew with Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin, like we had said. They were some of the first children displayed on milk cartons and on a local and national level, which was was very, it wasn't, I wouldn't say beneficial in this case, but it's a great thing to do. This was part of a campaign led by the National Child Safety Council in partnership with dairy companies. And milk cartons at the time actually had ads on them, which I was not aware of. But the children's photos were placed there instead of ads to help publicize their cases. And it quickly became a cultural phenomenon and missing children's pictures were placed on more than just milk cartons. I think they were on, I had read pizza boxes, shopping bags, and even toll tickets, which I think toll tickets is such a great idea since we do see interstate abductions and children being, you know, transferred across state lines. And the practice of putting children on the milk carton isn't around anymore. But you can still see photos of missing children and adults in money mailer ads and in stores. I know in Walmart, whenever I go into a Walmart, I always see a display at the front with missing children. And the Goshes, along with John Walsh and Aton Patz's parents, went on to become major activists for missing children and they changed the world. Like we said, police protocol at the time was to wait 72 hours before a child could be reported missing. And we know now that the first 48 to 72 hours are critical in finding a missing person or finding a lead in a murder. If you wait longer than that time frame, evidence can be damaged and people's memories aren't as fresh. In the early 80s, there was really no infrastructure or system to help police with missing children's cases. But in 1982, Congress passed the Missing Children's Act, and in June 1984, the Goshes, along with the Walshes, whose young son Adam was abducted and murdered in Florida, helped create the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children provides assistance to victims, families, law enforcement, social services agencies, mental health agencies, and others when they need help with a missing, exploited, or recovered child. And just a month after that, in 1984, the Johnny Gosh Bill was signed into Iowa law, which required law enforcement to act immediately when a minor is reported missing, which is now a national standard. Because of these tools, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the recovery rate for a missing child is now 99% 
60% as opposed to the 62 to 64% when Johnny went missing. It's really terrible that it took these tragedies to bring about these great resources, but where would we be without these parents advocating so hard in doing this work? I hope it's helped them heal in some way. I did want to mention that according to the FBI's National Crime Information Center missing person file, there are 87,438 active missing persons records of which juveniles under the age of 18 account for 35% of the records and that is a U.S. statistic and that is as of December 31st, 2019. And the past two years in the U.S., the number of missing children's cases has been between 421,000 and 424,000 cases and these, of course, only account for children reported missing. Like we said, Noreen dedicated her life to finding Johnny and helping others, but she faced a lot of backlash because of it. She was ridiculed by police and the FBI who even called her a loon. The public viewed her as abrasive and when they saw her on TV, it was almost like, oh my god, here she goes again. But everything she was doing was within her rights and aside from this media backlash and police not cooperating, the Goshes had to deal with prank calls, death threats, and con men attempting to exploit them. I just want everyone to imagine if your child went missing and law enforcement were not helping you, what would you do? Would you just give up or would you act like Noreen and fight tooth and nail? In the documentary Who Took Johnny, a Des Moines journalist who was a new reporter at the time of Johnny's disappearance said the horror of the crime was lost, particularly on her and her young and childless colleagues. She also said, quote, we failed to think that someone's life was falling apart, end quote, which I think really sums it all up. It's easy to disconnect from a story like this because who wants to be in the shoes of a woman whose son vanished? Noreen has faced a lot of trauma in her life aside from her son going missing. Her first husband died from cancer, and shortly before that, she almost lost her two older children in a tornado. She remarried to John Gosh, but the two did divorce in 1993, and she once again married, and she seems to be happy, and she seems to be at peace. She's still continuing to do a lot of advocacy work, and she also helps other parents of missing children. We've said this on our episodes about Misty Copsey and Mitrice Richardson, but if your loved one goes missing, and we hope that does not happen to anyone listening, you need to be their biggest advocate, and sometimes you need to do the police's work, unfortunately. Johnny was a white child from the suburbs, and if the police weren't going to help him, who would they help? And that leads us to the police error and alleged cover-up. Noreen has always claimed the police were no help and that a cover-up took place. So like we said, police arrived 45 minutes after her 911 call. They ignored eyewitnesses, and I know that eyewitness statements aren't the most reliable, but five people had very similar stories. And again, we have the idea that a child ran away, which was always the answer police gave families in this time period. It is kind of part of that culture and idea of no one would abduct or hurt a child, the kid just ran away. It kind of gives this false sense of safety, I would say. And Imagine how many crimes could be solved if police took action and didn't think of them as runaways. And obviously, children and teens do run away. They do account for a large number of missing children. According to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they assisted law enforcement and families with more than 29,000 cases um, of missing children, and 91% of those cases were endangered runaways. But it seems that we don't take runaways very seriously either if we're just saying, okay, the kid ran away, we gotta wait a few days, and then I guess we'll look for them. Noreen said police never did searches and didn't cooperate with her and John. We do know that the police did at least do an initial search of the neighborhood, but I couldn't really find anything else that they had done. Chief Orville Cooney was shown to be corrupt. He was fixing tickets for people. He was working while he was drunk. You don't do that, especially as a police officer. And the fact that police still say that they have no idea what happened to him is so infuriating to me. They seem to be the only people without any theories, really. I know we said that one lieutenant thinks he's dead, which I can understand that's plausible, but there's so much information that would point that he was a victim of human trafficking 
thinking like can't you at least search that three boys in a similar age range in a similar area went missing two years apart from each other that looks like a pattern and i'm sure that there are details that the police can't share with us but wouldn't you think there was some type of connection especially between johnny and eugene i mean the average person can kind of look at this stuff and see okay they were both paper boys they were abducted in the early morning and they both happened to not be with an adult that day and like we said, why didn't they even talk to Paul Bonassi? A cameraman for America's Most Wanted said in the documentary that he didn't understand why police didn't talk to Bonassi and even said this behavior is what leads people to believe a cover-up was involved. And I completely agree. The police had no leads or evidence. Why not just talk to him and see where it goes? Especially since private investigators that the gosh is hired did believe Bonassi. And I read that they maybe didn't do this because Benassi was charged with perjury, which I can understand, but at the same time, I think that was a poor decision on their part. Like we said, there's a question of a cover-up that's kind of at the core of Johnny's case, but who exactly the police may be protecting is unknown. But if we look at the Franklin Credit Union scandal that Benassi claimed to be a part of, we could assume it's rich, powerful, and prominent local residents and maybe even nationally known people. And oftentimes, these trafficking rings are kept going and kept quiet because the leaders blackmail the clients in addition to the victims as Benassi stated and what Noreen said Johnny said to her. So when looking at corrupts, I think it's always a thing of the highest levels of government officials and police being involved. I think that the fact that they didn't even try to present a credible theory tells a picture of they are so consumed with their own power that they don't even think that they owe Noreen that. You know, even in cases like the Maitrese case, which there's some alleged cover up with that case, at least they proposed a theory. At least they tried to cover it up with, well, we looked at the facts and this is what we think happened. In this case, it looked like, well, he's just a boy and he's a boy that we quite frankly don't care about and we quite frankly don't care about this mother either. So we're just going to keep it going and we're not going to show any level of compassion or empathy for what they're going through. And honestly, that's typically tied to their pockets being lined and them being in a position not to care. Because if you actually cared about your job, if you actually cared about making sure that when a criminal act happens, that the right people are being arrested and prosecuted for it, it wouldn't matter who it was. It wouldn't matter what type of mother she was. So I definitely think there is a lot of credibility. I definitely think that there's a lot of credibility to the alleged cover-up scheme that was going on in West Des Moines, Iowa at the time. You bring up such a good point that they couldn't even come up with a theory, an idea of what happened. I mean, they didn't flat out say we didn't, we don't know what happened, but they did say, you know, there was no crime here. And I said this before, but he was 12 years old. Where could he have gone? He couldn't drive. He didn't have his bike. Where would he have gone? What would he have done? How would he have survived for so many years later. It doesn't make sense. And I do know that maybe to play devil's advocate, maybe they had their own theories going, but they couldn't announce it to the public because we do know that police sometimes do that to hide not to hide information, but the public doesn't need to know everything. And sometimes giving the public too much information can hurt a case. But I don't really think that was the circumstance here. Yeah, and that's true. There is a lot of times where they need to withhold evidence because you don't want everything out in the public sphere. But the police chief went on different shows shit talking Noreen. So I feel like if you can do that, you can present a plausible theory about what you think happened to Johnny. Exactly. And Noreen is such a badass because she had said that Chief Cooney like screamed in her face and she said to him, You don't need to yell at me, I'm listening. So badass. I love her. <laughs> so let's get back to the Franklin scandal because it does play a big role in Johnny's case. And this scandal has so many twists and turns in itself that it could be a podcast alone and maybe we'll cover it another day. Who knows? Um, it's a conspiracy that even goes into Satanism and cannibalism. John DeCamp, Benassi's lawyer, later became a politician and wrote a book on the potential cover up, which I haven't read, but I do really want to read. It's kind of hard to find. But he believes that high level government 
officials wanted to keep everything quiet and did everything they could to discredit Paul Benassi. He wonders why the FBI completely refused to investigate Benassi's claims regarding Johnny Gosh, saying, quote, it was a forbidden zone, they wouldn't even talk about it, end quote. In 1993, a British production company began doing a documentary on the Franklin scandal. It's called Conspiracy of Silence, and you can find it online. I haven't watched it yet, but I do want to watch it. It's actually on the Johnny Gosh website, and I think you might be able to find it on YouTube too. While the company was filming the documentary, they were stopped by a larger U.S. media company. Um, They weren't really given a reason for why they had to stop. The documentary ended up getting finished, like I said, and this production company also tried to get interviews and comments from the FBI and other organizations, but they faced a lot of backlash. No one wanted to talk about the Franklin scandal. And even during the Johnny Gosh documentary, no one wanted to, no government officials wanted to talk about that either. In 1990, investigator Gary Caradori was investigating Paul Benassi's claims for the Nebraska state legislation, and he urgently phoned state senator Lauren Schmidt from Chicago saying he had found the smoking gun. Caradori told Schmidt he would fly that night from Chicago on his private plane with his son back to Lincoln, Nebraska. The plane exploded over Aurora, Illinois, killing Caradori and his son. And according to an eyewitness, just before hearing the explosion, he saw a flash of light. Caradori's briefcase and the rear seat of the plane were never recovered. How much of a coincidence is that, Dell? This is like scary to even talk about. Right, because you think of flash of light, you think of maybe a bomb or a missile, you think that the briefcase is gone. But more importantly, you look at the rear seat never being recovered and you think, well, why wasn't it recovered? Was it covered in blood from a gunshot? Was it that it has some evidence on it that would lead to the plane not, you know, all of a sudden just crashing? Who knows? (laughs) You know, this is all speculation. Yeah, who knows? Like we said before, Del and I love conspiracies, so maybe we will go into this a little further, but we know that powerful people are involved powerful people will do anything they can to keep up appearances. And we wanted to end on the fact that in 1999, Benassi filed a civil lawsuit against Lawrence E. King and accused him of sexual assault, false imprisonment, and being forced to scavenge for other children. A judge ruled in Benassi's favor and awarded him $1 million, which was never paid. One of the biggest things that stood out to me from the Who Took Johnny documentary is when Noreen talks about rich pedophiles and poor pedophiles. She essentially says that poor pedophiles have to risk getting caught and going to prison to have access to children. But rich pedophiles on the other hand, can hire someone to do the dirty work for them. And I think that's very well said and really sums up this case and also child sex trafficking in general. That wraps up this week's case and sets us up for next week's episode, where we'll focus on a more modern case of human trafficking. We're, of course, talking about the case of Jeffrey Epstein. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think happened to Johnny. Do you think he's still alive? Do you think that he was sold into human trafficking? Make sure you click the subscribe button. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform and youtube every wednesday with a new episode make sure you leave us a five-star rating and a review you can follow us on instagram at crime corruption cocktails and on twitter at charade inc please consider donating to our patreon this will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you we appreciate any amount you can give this is jenny and dale signing off stay safe